More than once I've heard the term apocalyptic being mentioned about recent events. This week when powers have been challenged, when deep evil and injustices have been exposed, when institutes that were once impenetrable bastions of freedom and democracy now seem fragile. Apocalypse. Not the prophetic glance towards the future, but in the sense of unveiling, unveiling the true condition of things, the hatred that lies underneath. Ironically, as curtains were lifted and unveiled, other curtains were being brought down in the form of censorship, as Twitter accounts were frozen and then permanently suspended. It reminded me of growing up in Northern Ireland, where censorship was used a lot by the British government. Whenever certain politicians that were tied into political terrorist organisations wanted to make a political statement on the television, the British government would allow their face on TV and you could see their moving lips, but the voice was a dub over of an actor, usually a, an English voice. And even though the words were the exact words that the politician might want to convey, his voice was still being downplayed. It's a subtle but important statement being made that to use your freedom to incite violence is never acceptable. And censorship happens when cultures become fractured and polarised. Apocalypse, this unveiling. In Jesus' baptism, there's a very different type of unveiling, a moment when the heavens are, are broken open and the Father, Son and Spirit meet together to confirm the beginning of Jesus' kingdom ministry. And rather than unveiling deep divisions, it's to demonstrate how divisions might melt away through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, the baptism of Jordan uh, of Jesus at the Jordan River just might seem so far removed from what has happened here in the United States this week. And yet, I think if we ruminate on baptism in this week, it might help us find our centre again. Because this is the place where we get so many signals of how this gospel is going to play out in Jesus' life and in our lives. And more than this, maybe this baptism is an invitation to see people around us as the baptised in Christ, the beloved of Christ. So three things that Jesus' baptism does for us today. It redefines our identity, it redefines our leadership, and it redefines how we see. First of all, it redefines our identity. Baptism redefines Jesus' followers. There's so much that's unorthodox here about how uh, baptism is happening in the desert through this unorthodox baptizer figure, John, uh, and following the fashion of breaking traditions, just like the way John was born and Zechariah was struck down. John baptizes, not in the temple, but in the wilderness. Ritual washing would have been common in Judaism, but it always happened around the temple in preparation for worship in specially constructed baths. It didn't need this figure clothed in camel hair to do it for them. In some ways, this one-off baptism in the Jordan River is more akin to what was expected of the Gentiles whenever they wanted to transfer over and transfer allegiances to the Jewish faith. And yet, John wasn't calling outsiders to come in. No, it was people from all over Judea and even the capital city, Jerusalem. John was calling the insiders in to see again, to, to repent. This baptism was showing that outsiders would be welcomed in, but insiders also needed to do something to reorient themselves to Jesus. Simply being born into a place of Jewish privilege was not going to guarantee your standing in the kingdom. Repentance was necessary. It was a new beginning, a new turning back to God. And in many places, uh, and in many ways, the, the place here 
of where all this was happening was so significant, the Jordan River, because this was the place of homecoming, the river God's people crossed in order to get to the promised land, the place where conquest was going to take place. But what is happening here is so different because Jesus plunges down into the waters and the waters split open and so too do the heavens and that reminds us of another event that happened in this people's history. The heavens are torn apart. That's violent language. The, the only other time this word rent apart is used is in Isaiah 64 after Isaiah talks about how God looked down in pity on the people uh, and split open the, the Red Sea to lead them from oppression to freedom. And Isaiah was saying to God, please do it again, God. Won't you rend the heavens open? Oh, that you would rend the heavens apart and come down and help us. And isn't that what we're seeing now? Jesus has come to give this new beginning, a new exodus, a new liberation. But this time not from Egypt, but from the sin that captures us of evil itself. And the very way that Jesus' baptism is set up shows that this kingdom is good news, not just for one nation, not just for an elite group who are moving towards a land through conquest. It's available to those who still feel that weight of oppression by larger forces. Those who need the same kind of liberation that Yahweh brought through the Red Sea. And by standing in that River Jordan, Jesus was bringing together again two very different ideas. The idea, yes, of homecoming, but also of liberation. And that's important for us today because this week in the United States, we've seen Christians use their faith to justify very different positions, different outcomes. And deep in any nation's history, scripture has been used to endorse outcomes that seem at polar opposites. I've been reading Kelly Brown Douglas's book, Stand Your Ground, which analyzes how our faith is constructed through our culture. And she states how we can interpret the Bible differently. Take, for example, the story of Exodus, she writes. For those who are privileged, the tendency is to focus on being carried to a new land through conquest a God who stays with people through the wilderness journey. But for those people of colour, the focus is on God who liberates his people from a land where their bodies were devalued and destroyed, who carries them through the wilderness to bring life. And she says the faith of a nation gives way to a culture that negates black life, but the faith of a father affirms black life in the midst of a culture of death. So do you see how two very different perspectives emerge from this one Exodus story? But when Jesus was baptised in the Jordan River, that place where conquest was about to happen, he was redefining who could receive the gospel. It was available to everyone, even those who felt they had a privileged spot, they had to repent and reorient, and those who felt underprivileged could have access to inheritance too. This can't be a place where we hold on to our rights, to our national identities. It's the place where we open-handedly experience the freedom God wants to offer us. So Jesus' baptism redefines our identity. But it takes a unique kind of leader to be able to initiate this. It also redefines leadership. Whenever we hear those words being spoken over Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It connects us to many leadership stories in the Old Testaments. Those stories in the Psalms and in Isaiah, those moments like Psalm 2 when the king is about to be anointed in order to put all enemies under his feet. Or the servant king chosen in Isaiah, who was also this mighty divine warrior where the strong warrior again would come to deliver his people from all the nations. And as the Spirit comes down like a holy dove to rest on Jesus, you can't help 
but feel the difference between the royal inauguration that's talked about in Psalm 2 and Jesus who's going down, not up to a throne, but down into this dirty, filthy water. It's humiliating, but it shows us how he was going to go about defeating his enemies. Not by gathering this military, mighty, powerful army, but by humbly submitting to God's plan. And all the places where violence are mentioned in this passage, they're not attached to Jesus. The heavens torn in two, singling the new beginning. And then the spirit which comes down gently as a dove, but then it drives Jesus to the desert to be tempted by Satan. Yes, there's violence here, but only in the presence of what needs to happen in order to defeat Satan. Because you see, Jesus is willingly submitting humbly submitting to God's plan. Susan Williams writes, Jesus steps into the water with ease, resisting all attempts to define himself. And that is our journey too, so easy and yet so hard. Someone who knew this posture well in life and ministry was Hard Thurman. He tried to pattern this out, this principle of non-violent resistance like Jesus. And he writes, it would have been so easy for Jesus to adopt a position of armed resistance, a bit like the zealots who wanted to act out, act out and express their distrust of Rome. But Hard Thurman points out in Jesus and the disinherited that being a zealot quickly distorts to fanaticism. In all action, there's this operative, a fringe of irrationality. The fact that the ruler has available to him the power of the state and complete access to all arms is scarcely considered because out of the deep of the heart there swells a great and awful assurance that because the cause is just it cannot fail. And one of the ways by which men measure their own significance is to be found in the amount of power and energy other men must use in order to hold them back. Does that sound familiar? But Thurman writes, well, this was the zealots in action. It wasn't Jesus' way. This is not Jesus' way. Jesus chose the way of humility. Listen to what Thurman says. Jesus had to resent deeply the loss of Jewish national independence and the aggression of Rome. This natural humiliation was hurting and burning. The ban for that burning humiliation, however, was humility, for humility cannot be humiliated. Thus he asked his people to learn his ways. Jesus said, I'm meek, I'm lowly in heart, and that's where you'll rest in your souls. Take my yoke upon you, it's easy, my burden is light. And so when Jesus goes down into the river and is anointed royally with the holy dove, Yes, he's acknowledging how deep he has to go in order to wash out the stain of sin. He's acknowledging what it's going to take to bring together all the disparate, diverse peoples in the world into his new kingdom. It's going to take an even deeper descent, his own dead body being buried into the ground to break the power of Satan and to open up the new Exodus way, a liberation for everyone but not through might, not through power, but by the Spirit this happens, through the deep humiliation of the cross, so that anyone who feels low, or anyone who feels that the world has abused or hated them, can find someone who sinks lower under them and lifts them up. This is the new kind of leadership that Jesus exhibits. Jesus' baptism redefines our identity, a place where the inherited and the disinherited can meet together. It redefines leadership, a kingdom whose way is marked out by humility. And finally, it redefines a new way of seeing. Many people still wonder, well, why? Why did Jesus need to be baptised, especially when he was without sin? He didn't need cleansing. And yet to hear those words, you are my beloved son, even before he'd done anything, before any miracles of note, 
He was acknowledging that his ministry was going to happen from that deep center of being the beloved one, being equipped by the Holy Spirit resting on him. When our first son Ian was baptized, my then boss baptized him and he took Ian in his arms and spoke those words over him that come from the Scottish Presbyterian form of baptism. He said, Ian, for you Jesus Christ came into the world. For you he lived and showed God's love. For you he suffered the darkness of Calvary and cried at the last, it is accomplished. For you he triumphed over death and rose in newness of life. For you he ascended to reign at God's right hand. All this he did for you, little one, though you do not know anything of it, so that the word of scripture might be fulfilled. We love because God loved us first. I find those words so powerful that God loved us before we achieved anything. Because isn't it true that for the rest of our lives we try to gain our worth, to achieve things, to prove ourselves. And yet our baptismal identity tells us we're immersed in this grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that the Spirit, that same Spirit rests on us and cleanses us and renews and transforms us. Baptism is this word of grace spoken over us by the church. Before we cognitively understand the story or contribute anything of significance, before we have anything to show for ourselves, before we can even doubt it, before we can even confess it, Jesus is eternally beloved by the Father. And that belovedness passes on to us. In Church of the Servant, you may have noticed that as you go through the front doors, there's this baptismal font on the side. The water doesn't often run, but the idea, I believe, is that when the church was built, the idea was to dip our hands in the baptismal font as we enter worship as a reminder, this is our identity. We're the beloved ones. Because when we're in worship, we're immersing ourselves in the grace of God all over again, that no matter what stones of disruption, no matter what political upheaval, is put in our way, we can throw them back into this river of grace and no peace will return to us and peace will flow. And so as you leave to go and live out your baptismal vocation this week, I wonder how would our interactions be different if we put on this way of seeing, seeing others as baptised in Christ, that the Imago Dei rests on them as well. This has been a week where it's been challenging to see the work of Christ in each other. But we don't have a private personal salvation, it's for the whole world. And so maybe as a starting point, as you wash your hands over and over again in every single day, use that washing as an opportunity to remember your baptismal identity, that you're a child of God that the Holy Spirit rests on you now too, that he's powerfully at work in your life. And then think about the others that you're struggling to love. And as you keep washing your hands, pray blessing on them and bless them from the bottom of your heart that you might see the beloved work of Christ in them because that's the beatitude, the being in attitude like Christ to bless those who curse you. And the more you bless another person, that part of your life, that you would reserve for anger and hatred will soon have to give way to the even larger work of the Holy Spirit. Bless until you really, really mean it. I love that the baptism of Jesus is where the meaning of the kingdom really started because once Jesus rose up from the waters, just look at the life he lived dependent on the Spirit, truly seeing the Samaritan woman at the well with love truly noticing the little children, performing miracles, loving the poor, sleeping through the storm. When Ian got baptised, he cried hard. And the minister, as he was holding him, he just quizzically looked at Ian and said, but this child never cries. But there's something about baptism that's supposed to resemble that moment of human birth when the baby cries hard. It's about life. And today, 
Even though the storms swell around us, Jesus calls us to live life and to see life in others. But it starts with remembering that grace of baptismal identity, that before we were worth anything, God spoke and God loves us. So yes, it has been an apocalyptic week, but we turn our eyes to Jesus to see again the cosmic possibilities for renewal that far outweigh national disturbances and political unrest because even in the desert those words are spoken you are my beloved one and in you i am well pleased so take these words and live them from the center of your being in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit Amen.